Welcome to the author interview series for gastrointestinal endoscopy. My name is Dr. Glenn Eisen. I am the editor-in-chief of GIE. And today I will be discussing uh, with the paper Placement of Fully Covered Self-Expanding Metal Stents in Patients with Locally Advanced Esophageal Cancer Before Neoadjuvant Therapy. Uh, the doctor who will be discussing this is Dr. Douglas Adler, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Director of Therapeutic Endoscopy at the University of Utah. Welcome, Dr. Adler. Thank you, Dr. Eisen. And thank you so much for submitting your paper. Um, can you tell me, Dr. Adler, the impetus for writing this paper? So both uh, Ali Siddiqui and I, Ali was the other lead author. Uh, Ali is at Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Both Ali and I had been corresponding for some time about our practice of treating patients with locally advanced esophageal cancer. Most patients that we were seeing at the time of diagnosis had locally advanced esophageal cancer with dysphagia, and there was, there's no consensus in the literature about how to manage those patients. Do they proceed directly to neoadjuvant therapy? Do they get a feeding tube? Do they get a peg tube? Do they get a stent? And the practice at both our institutions was to place stents prior to neoadjuvant therapy and we'd elected to pool our data and do a large retrospective study because all that the literature contained were a few small retrospective studies and we knew we had enough numbers to make a large study. Right. So your paper specifically discusses the use of fully covered metal stents and many papers in literature prior to this talked about partially covered or uncovered stents. When did you change your practice and why? So the change in our practice actually started several years ago. Uh, we never put partially covered stents in preoperative patients for fear that it could complicate attempts at surgical resection. And our surgeons were uncomfortable with us placing partially covered stents or even the idea of that. So a few years ago when we had first access to the fully covered plastic stents, we started with that in the sense that it was potentially removable, it wouldn't foul any surgery, it wouldn't interfere with follow-up CT scans. Uh, that device was limited in its utility, and then a few years ago when fully covered self-expanding metal stents came on the market, it seemed a logical progression to move to those devices because, again, we could place them in preoperative patients. It didn't eliminate or obviate any treatment. Um, the stent could be left in as a palliative if the patient didn't go to surgery, and again, it did not significantly interfere with follow-up CT scanning or CT PET scanning. So do you think you and Dr. Siddiqui were ahead of the curve using these types of stents, or others have been employing them but just haven't gotten around to publishing their data? I think that we probably were doing more of this earlier on. Uh, both Dr. Siddiqui and I are very interested in self-expanding stent technology, uh, and I think that both of us saw that this was a potential niche for these devices that hadn't yet been filled. Have you seen any downside to employing that type of stent? Because in my mind, there's a much greater risk of migration, given that there's right. nothing to anchor it. Right. So there's definitely a downside uh, to the stents. I think that fully covered stents have some of the downsides of partially covered stents. Mm -hmm. uh, the first and foremost being, I think, actually pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and in our study, uh, about a quarter of patients experienced some degree of pain, and in some patients that was quite significant. There really is no self-expanding stent of any kind on the market that doesn't have at least a significant risk of some chest pain afterwards. Uh, we had about a third of patients, 17 of our 55 patients, experience migration at some time during therapy. And migration, I think, depending on how you look at it, may or may not be a bad thing in these patients. Uh, I think at first blush, you might say that migration of the stent after placement uh, is a sign that the stent has failed or that a significant negative has occurred to the patient. And that was our feeling going into the study, although our thinking on this has evolved over the last few years because we actually now tell patients if the stent migrates, especially if the migration is not immediate, obviously immediate migration is a bad thing. It probably implies something about the, the tumor-stent relationship was not proper. But if patients have delayed migration of the stent, especially after they've had at least several weeks of neoadjuvant therapy, it usually implies a tumor response, sure. right? The, the tumor has gotten smaller, the stricture has become less severe, there's less to anchor or give the stent purchase in the stricture, and the stent migrates. Um, so we actually tell patients if the stent migrates and you're swallowing okay, that's not necessarily a sign that anything is wrong, and it implies that maybe you're responding to, to your treatment. 
Were there any complications resulting from the migration or other complications just from the stent placement beyond chest discomfort? We didn't have complications from migration themselves. We didn't also always feel a need to retrieve the stent. So I think there's also a, a somewhat false perception that if the stent migrates, you have to run in and get it. And I don't think that that's true at all. I think if the stent migrates and the patient has an intact pylorus, which mm -hmm. is true in the vast majority of patients, there's very little risk that the stent will exit the stomach and transit the small bowel if they have an intact pylorus. And the patient can simply have the stent in the stomach. They can eat. It doesn't affect their ability to eat, or most patients don't even perceive the stent in their stomach, even though it's mobile. Um, we did move the, we moved the stent if patients specifically asked to have it removed, or if just the notion of the stent being in their stomach bothered them, but we did not routinely remove the stents. Mm -hmm. And can you compare and contrast the benefits of having this type of stent versus having a feeding tube or a G-tube? Right. So I think that you could, there, there's two things you have to compare it to, really. So you can compare the stent to some sort of nasoenteric tube, mm -hmm. which is the cheapest and the easiest, or some sort of transabdominal wall feeding tube. Um, I think that the upside of the stent is that it allows per oral feeding for nutrition, hydration, and medications immediately. Mm. Uh, and patients look the same. They don't have a catheter hanging out of their nose. They don't have to have a tube placed in their abdomen. I think that's the biggest advantage. They have an improvement in their dysphagia scores. And they definitely have, uh, although we didn't specifically address quality of life, other studies have addressed quality of life in this setting. Um, the downside compared to, for example, a transnasal feeding tube is clearly cost. Uh, these stents cost, you know, anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 as opposed to maybe $80 to $100 for a, a transnasal feeding tube that can be removed with no difficulties at any time if there's ever a problem with it. Uh, but most patients don't like having a catheter coming out of one of their nostrils and tucked behind their ears for three months. Um, with regards to transabdominal wall feeding tubes, I think that most centers, including both Jefferson and the Huntsman Cancer Center, have gone very sharply away from preoperative peg tubes in these patients. Mm -hmm. um, there's a growing body of literature that suggests that surgical outcomes in patients with esophageal cancer who get a peg tube are worse because they've created a fixation point between the stomach and the anterior abdominal wall that during the surgery requires defixation and mobilization and there's more of a risk of post-surgical complications. I think if uh, patients want to have a jejunostomy tube, that's certainly an option that probably would not complicate surgery, but again, it would not allow oral nutrition, hydration, or delivery of medications. Um, and we didn't, you know, we discuss all these options with the patients, um, and most patients opted for uh, a stent if it was possible. Sure, they'd much rather have per oral intake. Right. So one of the things that was, I read in your paper, which was interesting to me, was the initial staging of the patients, yet despite that, with favorable staging, very few ended up having surgical resections. Were you right. surprised by that, and how do you explain that? Well, I have to tell you, I think that in, in my mind, that was the most striking finding of the entire study. Um, only uh, 8 of 55 patients ultimately went on to have definitive surgical therapy. And I think that it, it reflects the fact that Locally advanced esophageal cancer, when combined with dysphagia, is probably a terminal disease for most patients. Uh, whereas locally advanced esophageal cancer without dysphagia, we, I can't comment on definitively because those patients didn't require a stent or a feeding tube. Right. But when we saw patients who had the combination of a locally advanced tumor and swallowing difficulties, we were both very surprised, Dr. Siddiqui and myself, at how few went to surgery um, and how many of them either develop metastatic lesions during chemoradiation therapy that precluded them from having surgery, uh, didn't develop metastatic lesions but became so debilitated by chemoradiation therapy that they were judged to be non-surgical candidates or simply decided that they themselves did not want to have surgery uh, and would just pursue non-surgical interventions. Um, so this has actually changed both for Dr. Siddiqui and myself I think the way that we discuss uh, future care with these patients, and I used to say, we'll put the stent in, you're swallowing it better, and when you go to surgery, the stent will be removed by the surgeon. And now we say, 
if you go to surgery. And we're, we're more upfront with the patients about the fact that this may be a definitive intervention to treat your dysphagia. It may end up being a palliative device. And uh, I think we, we present the fact that they have a surgical option in the future less strongly because so few of them seem to go ultimately to a curative surgical resection. Okay. Would you say, despite the fact that this is a retrospective paper with its inherent limitations, that this should be the standard of care in these types of patients? It's difficult to say exactly what standard of care should be, I think because um, we still, I think, are dealing with suboptimal stent devices. We included stents from three manufacturers right, in the stents. study, and they all had roughly similar complication rates. Uh, several of the patients had intractable pain. Mm. Um, you know, some of the migrations did result in recurrent dysphagia. Um, it's difficult to say that this should be adopted, I think, everywhere, but I think that at this point we can very safely say that this is something that should be offered to patients among other options such as a nasoenteric tube or a transabdominal wall tube. Uh, I think it's, we can at least say it's probably as good. I don't know if we can say that it's better in a global sense, but I think we can say it's at least as good for nutrition and hydration and those things. Patients' weight loss stopped. They were able to maintain their weights. But again, clearly I think uh, as other studies besides ours have shown that we don't have the ideal stent for this particular situation yet but I think the fully covered stents that we do have are the best option in 2012. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Adler. Thank you very much.